I will start pretty quick, fast. If you can't understand me, please raise a hand so I can repeat what I said. If you didn't get it, most everybody probably didn't get it either, so don't, don't hesitate to interrupt me at all. Um, that's what I say. Um, I like the Michael Jackson mic, but I'm not dancing. That would be horrible. I wasn't that, that, was, that was my attempt at, you should start your presentation with a joke. Yeah, that went well. <laughs> ah, that one went well. All right, let's go. Uh, I have a ton of slides. Um, my name is Jan Lenart. Um, anybody who knows me? Yay. <laughs> Woo yeah. um, I'm an open source developer. Um, I work on CouchDB, obviously, otherwise I wouldn't probably wouldn't give that talk, although I talk about other stuff as well. Um, if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, that's the link. If I don't get at least 30 more followers by the end of this talk, I'm re get really, really angry, and I stop the conference, and you can all go home, and I keep all your money. I'm a whore for followers. No, I'm not. So w if you're interested in the stuff I do, follow me, but if you don't, don't. If you have any questions later, if you have any questions now, raise your hand and ask while I'm talking. We have a few minutes at the end, I hope. Um, I'll be around. This is my well, I'm part of my conference, so I'll be around. Ask any question in the hallway. When you get home and still have a question, use that Twitter nick if you like Twitter to get in touch with me. I'll help answer any questions you will have. You can also use my email address if you like. It's a fancy Apache Oak address. It means I'm important. <laughs> well, not really. It's just al also really nice to, uh, to remember. So don't hesitate to ask me any questions anytime, basically. Hi, Matthias. Thanks. That's the slide. You had a slide about me, I had to do a slide about you. But it was really good. Like, who liked the introduction to NoSQL, especially the historic things? Yeah, a few more hands. Good. Um, so yeah, it's, he set a pretty good stage for what I want to do. So thanks. Um, this is the NoSQL track. CatchDB is one of the NoSQL databases, so i got to talk a little bit about that. Um, there are a ton of projects. Um, Grant in the keynote asked what we, we um, associate with open. And one of the things I associate with open is NoSQL. It's an open-ended class of projects, and whoever thinks, uh, I might have something that is NoSQL-ish, I'm a NoSQL database now. Um, where for, for two years it was just, uh, for a long time it was just CouchDB, and then a few others joined. Um, and suddenly these Neo4j guys started popping up in blogs. Hey, by the way, we have a graph database. It's also a NoSQL database. Little Peter over there saw a lot of these comments. So way to go with your, with your viral PR. That worked very, very well. So you're now in the feature talk here. That went good. So there are a ton of projects. CouchDB is just one of them, and everybody in the projects themselves are sort of like, yeah, we are NoSQL, but like we're really this unique, awesome thing. And NoSQL doesn't really say what you are. But you probably just see NoSQL is just a big class of things. Um, the interesting thing is that each product has, built, has been built upon a core idea and to solve a problem very, very well, for example. And then it they got extended. Either it's a very general idea, so it's applicable to a lot of cases, or um, these databases got extended to solve more problems. But to the point where I say that um, with any NoSQL database, you can do 80% of anything you could do with any other database, even the relational ones. It doesn't matter. You can use flat files. If it, it's really the, the, the kind of specialization you don't need. The overlap is just too big. I can do the same thing in CatchDB and Neo4j for run my personal block. It doesn't matter. There's a case to be made for the people who do, for example, Rails, rapid web application development um, with any tool, really. They want to get stuff out to the customer. And if they have well, 1,000, 2,000 customers, maybe high-paying customers a day, they the fuck don't need a scalable database. It runs on MySQL. They, get, they can ship over a weekend. They get, well, fame, and money, whatever. It doesn't really matter what kind of database they use. Like That is, puts all of this a little bit into perspective. But I want to talk a bit about the core ideas. Um, actually, I don't want to talk about, about all the core ideas. Um, the interesting thing that is, that NoSQL is for me and that I'd like to like get the community to accept is that NoSQL is about choice. Giving users or people the freedom to choose a database that suits their problem or problems, multiple databases in one go and one, one setup possible, choose something that, is, that suits the problem best instead of using a one-size-fits-all solution. So if anybody would ask what is NoSQL, I li I s I'd like to say it's about choice. It's not a definite answer. It's not about scaling. It's not about big data. It's not about ad hoc queries, whatever, the things he just li Matthias just listed. It's about being able to choose. So if we as the NoSQL movement would be able to 
get on one could agree on one message i'd like to be that but i'd also like your suggestions if you work on a project on what that could be uh, and what would be better so i'm not the like public pr guy of the nosql movement so it's about building building better systems um in general so today, today i like to talk about the, the core idea that couchdb is built around and why i think well, well i work on couchdb obviously have been for a while so i must believe in the core idea and why it's awesome and why it's better than all the other ones because otherwise i would work on one of the others um, that needs to get there. I need to start my story arc. So I'm setting that up here. It's the first thing that I got to talk about. One of the things that often comes up, I love that you can all hear me drinking. By the way, that's uh, pretty cool. One of the things that always, you know, that, that is the core topic of this conference that comes up in NoSQL discussions a lot, and one of the core things that the Dynamo paper describes, or the big table one, um, a scaling, being able to grow, whatever. Scaling is like NoSQL, a very fuzzy term. Scaling can apply to anything, really. People say Rails doesn't scale, and they have a, like opinion about that, and that might be right or wrong, I don't know. But people can say that. Databases scale, architecture scale, languages scale, performance scale, CPU, whatever. Everything scales, so scaling is a very sh shady uh, thing to talk about. In databases, it usually means being able to easily add capacity, to store more stuff, to handle more parallel requests, concurrent requests, or, um, what's, that's another one. TS, help me out. I'm blanking. I should have had presenter notes. Um, oh, throughput, making it all, like growing bigger. And making that a lot easier. There's a lot of management overhead with that, so making that very easy for the user to just, the, the dream idea, the thing that, that Cassandra aims to is that you need more capacity to well, any of these three things, and then you can just add a machine, and the, the, the system magically figures out how to use these machines' resources, and then you s you scale a little bit, and that you can just keep doing that while you get more users, the natural growth thing. That's very, very cool to do. It's also very hard. Um, so yeah, I'm talking about scaling up. That's the first, the big the big one. That that all the, well not all, but most of the NoSQL databases try to achieve, and which is also really interesting because scaling up is interesting for the web. It means, beco ne it means becoming distributed, uh, adding fault tolerance. You cannot afford a website to be offline. Um, Small side note here. I come from the web. Who else is from the web? Okay, there's a bunch of people who are not from the web. When I say a website, I mean a database installation. So it can be in telco, it can be banking, whatever else. It doesn't have to be a website per se. But um, I just mean in general database installation just because that's what I'm doing and I have been doing for a long time. But just a website is just installation for me. So in the web, it's very interesting to scale, scale up. Um, the guys at Facebook uh, face that, haha. -ha. Flickr, Twitter, they all they all have their scaling solutions and problems. And everybody loves scaling in the geek community. Who really likes to like s invent a hash ring and then fail over scenarios and the algorithms to pick a quorum? Who likes that kind of hard stuff? Yeah, you're all geeks, everybody. <laughs> because it's hard and we love hard problems. It's it's like it's really good. And once you you figure the problem out, it's like all right, I've done it. And then you gotta write the code. <laughs> and then when you've done that, yeah, I've done it, then you've got a debug, and then like this this is an energy level that we'd like as geeks, as programmers, we like to keep up. That's pretty cool. We like hard problems, if they're applicable or not. So it's cool that we can solve all the scaling problems, but um, very few people actually have that problem. I know this is probably the wrongest conference to, t to tell you, because maybe all of you need the big data, but you need to, like I want to put that a little bit into perspective that you are a crazy minority. Everybody else who's upstairs, not upstairs in this, but like in the real world upstairs, <laughs> or maybe next door in the U-Bahn, they don't have big data scaling problems. <laughs> Most people don't have that. Um, I'd say less than 1% of all the installations in the world need a scalable solution. Um, that said, caveat, um, CouchDB allows you to scale up um, because we like that too, and we are the geeks, and we like to solve hard problems. Um, we're approaching it a little differently from all the others. Um, we believe getting the core of the database right is really, really crucial. And we also believe that there's no one-size-fits-all solution to scaling. So systems like Cassandra were born at Facebook out of the necessity uh, to build a scalable database. They couldn't take anything off the shelf, so they built something um, that, that fit their needs. And it, it, it does work for Twitter. Now Facebook moved off to HBase um, to get because that fit them even better. Um, so they had to do a little bit of experimentation. Twitter is still on Cassandra. Maybe they move too. I don't know. Um, so we we and there's a bunch of projects who try to aim to be the one size fits all solution for scaling data, which is by the very nature of thing a very, in my opinion, stupid idea because there's no 
one size fits all solution to scaling data, but then there might be ones that are 80-20 or 50-50 or 70-30, like uh, very applica uh, applicable to a huge class of problems and that's still useful to have a solution for that, uh, off the shelf solution for that. So with CouchDB, we believe that um, we should get, we, we don't build in any scaling uh, capabilities. You can't tell CouchDB, I'll spawn up a few more instances and figure something magic out. That is left as an exercise to the user. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, but we don't put any features in CouchDB that is on a single node that would break if you have two or more nodes. So CouchDB's use, uh, feature set is very restricted compared to other ones. The, the querying in MongoDB is crazy cool compared to what CouchDB can do. But then scaling the CouchDB model is a whole lot easier. Just as an example, not saying MongoDB is bad or CouchDB is good, but that's just a different thing. We, we specifically don't have any features that won't scale later. Even though you don't, like if you just have a single node installation for your personal block that can be offline in the end, that can be cool. You still can't use any fancy features that wouldn't scale if you have to. You gotta live with that in CouchDB. That is because it's uh, the core is built to scale up. It has also a bunch of hooks and mechanisms to build distributed clusters, to build large scale systems, but you need to do the actual building, put in the building box. And there's three implementations that I know of right now um, that achieve this cluster thing uh, by different concepts. One is a commercial one by the BBC, it's proprietary, they use that in a multi data center setup. Uh, next one is done by Cloudant. It will be open source soon. They have been saying that for a while and I hope it's happening actually soon, which is sort of modeled after Dynamo. So you would that, and that will end up probably in CouchDB core because that is actually a very, uh, it, 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 it solves a large class of scaling problems. So we, we think that should be one of the defaults you could be choosing. There's another one that is already open source called CouchDB Lounge, which has a, has a sort of fractals, uh, fractal hash ring scaling. Uh, scenario, which is pretty cool in itself, and it's production in, in production at Mebo, um, large large size and high traffic. So that all is pretty cool, but it's not built in. But there's other tools you can use on top of CouchDB. So the scaling we do, uh, but already said that might be not applicable to a lot of people. Me as a programmer, I like to impact a lot of people. And you could argue, well, if I build Cassandra, and Facebook uses or Twitter uses Cassandra, it can affect a whole lot of people. Since Twitter adopted Cassandra, the API got horribly slow, so they did have impact a lot of people with that. I'm not saying it's Cassandra's fault, it's just like non non correlational facts. I like but I also like to bash the Twitter guys. <laughs> just like I, oh, I like Twitter a lot. I use Twitter a lot and I like the guys that work there. Um, and they do a great job and they have incredibly hard problems to solve, but it's still fun bashing because everybody who's a Twitter expert? Who's an who's an expert in Twitter architecture? Yeah, you all are experts in Twitter architecture. I've seen all your comments and all the blog posts where Twitter didn't do anything. Said, yeah, it's because of this and that. Or all the Reddit is full of that and all the, the hacker news is full of these comments for somebody who is actually not employed at Twitter, who's the expert at the Twitter architecture. I'm neither an expert in Twitter architecture, so I like bashing the Twitter guys a little bit, but it's good fun. They bash us too, so. Um, impact. Um, I'm much more interested in the other 99% of the people who need databases, who mm, might be somebody who's not a technical person, who might be somebody who's not considering himself a programmer, somebody who just wants to store some data and want to make it data, a database accessible for that. Who really likes HyperCard? Who remembers HyperCard first? Who loves HyperCard? Who loved HyperCard back in the day? Who hates HyperCard? See, that was a very accessible database. HyperCard is awesome. So I'm um, more interested in that kind of impact. And again, it's a big story arc. This all fits together later. Keep that in mind. Scaling too. <laughs> um, everybody's always talking about the scaling up, up and to the right. You saw the graph on Matthias' slide. Everybody wants to do that, he said, and I'm like, yeah, right. <laughs> scaling down is equally important. Um, running, uh, got, well, got one of the core ideas of CatchDB is scaling down. Nice thing. Scaling down means you can run it on small servers, you can run it for personal stuff, you can run it on your local whatever notebook you have, it's no problem. Not that the others won't run, but it's meant to be easy to use. You can run on routers, others, other embedded systems. Why would you do that? I'll get to that. You can even run it on phones, smartphones so far. So we run on the, the, the Google Android actually. Uh, and then we have installations on the Maimo slash Migo from Nokia. Um, the N900 system, that's pretty cool. The Nokia guys love that. Um, Palm slash HP are putting it into the WebOS core. Well, CouchDB proper, pretty cool. 
iPhone, iPad, who is lover, lover of these things. I'm a, I'm a huge Apple fanboy, so most of well, some of you are too. Um, well, politics. Uh, also NDAs that would make them me breaking legs and stuff. So um, why is that all a good idea? I'll get to that. So I'll keep the tension. Everybody's really excited to like find out the conclusion? Yeah, cool. So to get there, I got to talk about, like, take another detour. Um, just to keep the tension, of course, because I got a few more minutes. What's actually, can I get a time update? Cool. Got oh, cool, thanks. <laughs> so ba back in the day when Tim Berners-Lee in invented the web, he didn't envision a centralized thing that Facebook is. He invented URLs for a good reason, that you can address anything that's anywhere else. A universal address, and like I can address something that's in a village in China, uniquely, or except there's a firewall maybe, but um, something in Central Australia, because everybody loves Australia. See, how might made Matthias happy again? Um, he didn't envision that. He's, he thought everybody would run their own web server, publish stuff to the web server, and then distribute the links somehow. He maybe didn't think that through. He thought maybe email, but that's not part of the HTML and web spec or HTTP specs. So you build all that so everybody could run their own web server. So that sort of didn't happen, because I believe the the people doing like web products like Netscape and Microsoft back in the day didn't think that was a good idea. So we end up with ended up with big centralized services. Early on AOL, later Facebook, Twitter too. And these services have a lot of power. Who here has a Facebook account? Who here canceled his Facebook account in light of the latest privacy issues? A few. All right. So um, they have a lot of power over users' data. And centralized power is a bad idea, you know. We all, well, Particularly in Germany, we know that's a bad idea, but I don't want to extend that to computers. Or I want to say uh, Facebook would be a fascist regime. That would be taking a little bit too far, but you get the idea that power can be abused, and Facebook is not that good about being open and transparent what people can share with others, so people are concerned. I'm more about power to the people. Yeah. A red shirt and everything. <laughs> um, giving people full control over their personal data on the web still being able to use a centralized social graph like Facebook, publishing to that, but keeping a copy locally first so that they always have a copy of that available, not having to use some API to scrape it back down. Um, counter example that Flickr is really, really good, except you're building something that is like Flickr, you can get all your data out of Flickr and a very nice API. They are awesome about that. They even enhance your data and you're allowed to get the enhanced data back. That's how you should do it. Like and uh, Facebook is not the only big central thing that I want to that I could be bashing. It's just like the prime example of it, and there was some press, and you all know about it. So it's not like I don't have anything personal against Facebook or Mark Zuckerberg. Never met that guy. Um, so I said Microsoft and Netscape didn't put a web server into um, uh, into the browser or into the users the users hands. Opera did two years ago. Who remembers Opera Unite? Who said or thought what the hell? <laughs> yeah. I'm, I was like working on CatchDB, I'm like, shit, they beat us to the market. Because <laughs> they had the same idea, putting a web server into users' hands. It's a good idea. And that's the web that Tim Berners-Lee actually envisioned. Incidentally, I was at a conference in Rostock two days ago, where, well actually three days ago, where um, the co-founder, one of the two co-founders of Opera were uh, at the night se evening sessions after we all got our cocktails. And he said, like, I'm usually talking at conferences that are like, 100x, so I'm kind of important, but he's a really nice guy, and he said, like, I'm deliberately coming to a s smaller developer-oriented conference, and I'd like you to ask me hard questions, whatever. And we asked him for two and a half hours all the hard questions we could think of, from why does Opera suck on this mobile phone, and he said, yeah, the VM on that phone was never meant to do 100,000 million object allocations that modern websites do, so Opera sucks on that, we need to work with that to what's your business model, how do you make money, to what was your code, like th all the, th the whole range of things that you could think about in Opera on the web. One of the things I took away, that you all know, uh, Opera sort of invented the tab browsing, they invented a bunch of other things that more, more browsers adopt. They have a track record of being early with an idea and then others have been catch playing catch up with that and taking it uh, to, the, to the mass market. And I, especially after this session with, with John, I believe Opera United is one of those. 
that people are more and more interested in having a local web server. So Opera United is doing that. Project Yaspera. Who here knows about Project Yaspera? Who donated? Donated. Awesome, guys. So for the others, um, spurred all of the uh, Facebook uh, personal data privacy issues. A uh, bunch of students at NYT, I think, said, oh, we got to build a distributed, like, power to the people social network. That's Project Diaspora. Within two weeks, they got a lot of media attention. They used Kickstarter, a website where everybody could like send a dollar or two or five or ten or a hundred uh, to donate to that. They collected over $250,000 from everybody on the web. That's pretty neat for somebody who just has a bad idea. Uh, or a good idea, sorry. <laughs> didn't mean to say. So privacy matters. And the people are ready to actually spend money on something where they can keep their privacy. Don't say it's mass market yet. I'm not saying Project Diaspora is or will be a success but I'm hoping they will, because they prove my point. Um, so how does that relate to the scaling down in the mobile earlier? Well, I'll get to that after I take another detour. <laughs> Short one, this one. Uh, a little bit, who's interested in technical details on CouchDB? Nice, you should all buy my book. <laughs> I'll get to that too. Um, Matthias probably took all the fun out of praising Jason now because it's awesome. Is anybody here doesn't like Jason? Cool. And it's because it doesn't have dates and it doesn't have comments, right? <laughs> <laughs> I know. Bug I like his his business partner, he's like, Yeah, Jason should have comments. I'm like, yeah, shut up. <laughs> you have no idea. Like at last year's conference, no, no scale Berlin. The last two weeks, I sure wish I had comments in Jason. <laughs> talked to Doc Crockford about it. There's a good reason why they don't have comments, so I understand the reasoning and it's cool, so I can still fit commentary into my JSON structure, but it really would be nice. But then JSON's a pretty universal um, uh, thing. It's the, the cool thing, the, the one that really, where it clicked for me, it's a subset of all programming language. It doesn't try to be a superset to have data structures that all the programming languages have, but a subset of all the program, of, of all the data structures of all the programming languages allow. So that means there's or arrays, hashes, strings, and integers, or numbers in general. But booleans, null, undefined, that's it. And all program, most of all programming languages can agree on that subset. So you can s serialize or deserialize anything. That's pretty cool if you use Java and Python and JavaScript all over the place. Um, it's pretty much lossless depending if you have a good float thingy in there. There's some I triple E magic that sometimes doesn't work. Um, so JSON's awesome. Um, mapping, reducing, um, who here knows MapReduce? Oh, that's good. You shouldn't be upstairs because they'll see guys talking about that as well. Um, I like to think about MapReduce as a way to thanks as a way to search your data or index your data without having to have a math degree. I when I ran SQL, I was still in school. I did a little bit set theory at school, but like it took a long time until I got the full model. Then I went to university and learned more about the math. I'm like, hey, that makes sense. It's all the same. Right, uh, three years later, I know how the thing works. Um, MapReduce, I, th I believe, is an easier way to look at your data. It's more flexible. Um, it's not, it probably doesn't, is, uh, it probably isn't as powerful a query language, well, because it isn't a query language, it's a way to build indexes or to do queries. Um, but for me, coming from SQL to MapReduce was sort of a brain fuck. Who, who has that situation? Yeah, more hands. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, so, well, maybe you were, well, maybe the others are very, very smart programmers who knew MapReduce before SQL, so that put you in an advantage. But, point being, um, switching is pretty hard and unlearning things is pretty hard and it took me a good six months to really get out of the SQL and relational mindset. Like, I'm MySQL certified, I know the shit out of MySQL. That was hard to unlearn all of that for the MapReduce. But then when I started explaining CouchDB to others who weren't necessarily database developers, they said, yeah, that's easy. I just have a map function here and just scans through all my data. I understand. I can do indexes here, and that's all pretty cool. And I finally came to the conclusion that's a much more natural way to query your data. Um, so it's easier, simpler for people maybe who are not computer experts. I bring that up again. Another cool feature of CouchDB is real-time changes. You can just open the socket and an HTTP socket to CouchDB and ask, give me any changes that happen. And then whenever something changes in CouchDB, a new document gets written or it gets deleted, you get a notification, that document got changed, that document got changed. And then you can do stuff on that. So you can use document and state machines. You have a state member in there and it's open and then you query, you get your 
or a new document gets dropped into the database with the state open, and then you get a notification, new open document is here. So maybe it's an invite request and it's open. So you know your backend logic needs to do some asynchronous slow stuff to set something up and set the state of the document to closed, which triggers another asynchronous event, sending an email, hey, your ticket has been resolved or your whatever thing has been done. So um, it's a way to build real-time and um, asynchronous things. It's really cool to build chat systems with that, with just CouchDB as, set as the chat server. It's pretty cool, it works pretty well and scales amazingly because there's just a little database in there. Um, and it's a good tool to build larger distributed systems too. So that is a pretty hot feature. Okay, one last thing. Okay, you know, so I should have like a progress bar on the, um, yeah, right. <laughs> I'll do that next time, loading. Uh, couch apps, who here has heard about couch apps? You don't count, you have a couch to be t-shirt. <laughs> okay, who, who loves couch apps? Sweet, there's a lot of like education to do for me, cool. So the idea of a couch app is, CouchDB has a RESTful API, and that is awesome because you don't have to compile any crazy drivers to talk to CouchDB. You can just point a browser, any HTTP client, at CouchDB, and we'll give you an answer. So say, when well everything has a URL, obviously, that's pretty nice, so you can point at things that are everywhere, not just locally available. So say you store some HTML in the database, which is a common thing you do, at least in CouchDB, that HTML gets a URL. So you point a browser at that URL, and the browser will render the HTML, and you have a static page in there. So CouchDB is a web server. Big deal, big whoop. Nice. Um, you can also put JavaScript in the database and reference that in the HTML, and then the browser loads that too in the browser, into the browser. And now you have a JavaScript execution environment, and you have Ajax to talk back to the database. Suddenly, you have an application that lives in the browser, has a way to talk to a database, and is a full application already. It doesn't need to talk to a Java layer, it doesn't need to talk to Rails, it doesn't need to talk to Django, Python, PHP, all these things are out. There's no middle words, a two layer system. It's less in your overall architecture. If you look at a operation perspective and reliability perspective, having less moving parts is a good idea. Having less code is a good idea. So like all the Rails stuff you've been doing, yeah, I'm not really interested in that. That said, CouchDB works very well in the traditional three tier situation. Works pretty good, Matthias is doing that all the time. He loves the rails, and he puts the CouchDB behind, and it works awesome. But the real cool thing, the core of the idea of CouchDB that I'm talking about, is not doing that. Crazy dog heresy, what uses with a browser talking to the database directly, like tell that any like serious DBA, and he'll probably quit his job if you're superior. Like That is really not cool. So this is really, again, about building leaner systems that are, I already mentioned that, that don't have as many moving parts, as much code to maintain to debug. So, oh, and also faster, of course. Less the, the fastest code you can write is the one you don't write because it never gets executed, it's the fastest one. So if you build systems that have less code, it's already faster, has less boxes, more awesome. So that's what we all want. So by getting rid of an entire layer, building Linux systems, everybody wins. Also impact, building, like who here has friends who are not computer scientists who know how to do HTML? Designers, no CS grads, still nerds, computer guys, girls, do the, 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 the HTML and the CSS pretty good. The designers I know, thanks, are pretty good at um, doing minimal basic stuff in jQuery. Putting a function here, some glitter there. So they built their own small JavaScript applications, no CS degree required. That's pretty cool. That comes back to the notes idea where somebody, or a secretary wants to collect some data here and there, it doesn't, well, doesn't want to use Excel because they need the distributed feature, they can click together a nice form to collect some data and then do run statistics on that in a very easy way for an end user that's not a technical person. And I'm like, you all guys love the technical issues and solve hard problems. Solving something for the average user is a little bit, well, it's not the funnest thing to do, but it has way more impact, and that's what I'm interested in. Like, I'm one of these guys who wants to make the world a better place. <laughs> so I want to make it easier for people to use, uh, to use computers. So by using less layers, uh, less infrastructure, less code, I make a lot more impact here, which is cool. So, hey, big picture. So I should have put a picture up there. Um, how does that all fit together? So what do we have? We have Cuts to be running on mobile devices, still big question mark. We have these lean, no middleware kind of applications, big question mark. We have scaling up and scaling down. How, what, well? Um, it all comes together with sync. Just 
out of curiosity, who here has a phone that syncs with your PC or Mac? When or do you encounter at least one situation where that was completely fucked up and you lost data? See? I wager the, uh, the iPhone model works pretty reliably, but only because it just replaces everything that's on the phone, that's on the computer. So that's not really sync. They can sync back, but really, it's kind of not good as well. So I wager to say that, say that there's no, in that for that scenario, no solution that actually does work. Um, and nobody has proved me otherwise so far, so I'm pretty good. So that's the same slide with a bang. Syncing in CouchDB is the killer feature. Well, I have another slide for that, too bad. It's easy as pie. You just you tell CouchDB, hey, I have two databases, two local, two remote, one local, one remote, one remote, one local, doesn't matter. You just tell them, ship all the, ch all the things that is on the one that are not on the other, just ship them over. And then CouchDB does its magic, and on then the, other, the second database has all the data that, the, that it didn't have before that it was in the first database. Easy as pie. There's automatic conflict detection, detection. If you write to two databases at the same time, and it is an independent change. That's a natural state of a conflict. Everybody's afraid of conflicts, right? They're scary. <laughs> no, they're not scary. If you have a distributed setup, it, as soon as you lose, uh, if you leave one computer you and you allow writes on multiple computers, a conflict is a natural state that your data can be in. And the sooner you, un uh, the sooner you accept that and think that's just something I got to deal with and dealing with it isn't, a, isn't that hard. I'll show you in a second. Um, then a lot of things become a lot faster, if, uh, easier. If you think, well, these I need to avoid these conflicts, that is a bad thing, well, think twice about that, maybe. Um, so, like I said, sync is CouchDB's killer, f killer feature. Um, let's see. Uh, who, uh, we're not alone, so we're not the crazy people, and we don't point to the other crazy opera people. Who they did that? We got they don't have sync, really. So, who, who thinks that is a good idea? Uh, Ubuntu is with me. Who loves Ubuntu? Who trusts these guys? Yeah, that's a lot. It's a very popular thing. So since mid last, no, since end of last year, uh, Ubuntu desktop ships with CouchDB by default as the core syncing service for your personal data, your address book data, your bookmarks, um, notes, other personal stuff gets stored in CouchDB. They wrote plugins to Firefox and all the other ones to store stuff in CouchDB to allow you, if you have two machines, maybe a laptop and a desktop computer, to seamlessly sync your personal data without a central point of control. Like mobile me does the same thing for the Mac, there's other things for other systems, but they always go through the cloud through a central system. The power thing again. And the Ubuntu guys say, yeah, this is pretty nice, we offer that too, there's a service called Ubuntu One. Um, that one. Uh, called Ubuntu One, where they have a cloud backup service for you to use, which is really nice. If you lose your machine, you have a, a nice backup in the cloud. Nice. Um, but they also allow you to do the peer-to-peer -peer sync without having to use that. That's that's a big privacy thing. People like that. Um, they also build desktop couch, all these plugins and specifications, how um, applications can connect to CouchDB and use all this. Um, it's been ported to the Mac now, so or it is going to be. No, is it, it is in the process of being ported to the Mac, so that's kind of nice. You can use it in other systems as well. It's very open, open standards, everything. That's, that's pretty awesome. Mozilla is on board. They have Mozilla Raindrop. Who heard about Raindrop? It's Mozilla's next generation messaging client. It's still in the like it's not even an alpha. They just it's a tech demo so far. But it's a couch app. It's a pure it's pure HTML and JavaScript living in the browser talking to CouchDB. There's an external process that talks all IMAP and Jabber and whatnot where you have all the messages that dumps it all into CouchDB. So this is a core component. But to the viewer and the center all of that, that is just pure CouchDB, which is really, really nice. Who here thinks Mozilla doing good stuff? <laughs> yeah, I thought so. So we're not alone. How does the mobile come in there? There's one more, one more thing that, that makes that go wow. Local data is king. That's a nice slogan. Uh, and also, um, being able to have a local copy of all your data, say you have a, have a smartphone, can you be running on it, and have a copy of all your data there is really, really nice. Because local data doesn't have la the latency that a remote data has. That you don't have to go to the server for each request. Your user experience is very, well, it's fast. People like fast. They get annoyed if something goes like over the wire. Maybe it's really, really slow. We are really lucky with the Wi-Fi here. The conference I went to wasn't that good at Wi-Fi. And they maxed out the UMTS as well, or the 3G. So that was a bit hard to deal with. Who is using Git for source control? See? You all believe in that already. So local data is cool. 
So it kills people's patience, something that's not responsive, people don't use. You lose customers, you lose users. The fastest computer on the network is always localhost. You cannot, by the laws of physics, add a box to a network to make the network faster. You always add latency, and latency is bad, as we just learned. So having local data is really, really cool. Um, uh, more who here has an Alice DSL thing or uses AT&T in San Francisco kind of thing? Yeah, there's always this situation where you're not connected when you can least afford it. And everybody's talking about the crazy cloud and we have all the big storage and whatnot. Yeah, I'm sorry, I just can't get to your fancy cloud, so I'm out of luck. I'm using something else that maybe has a local storage. Last big point, if you talk to mobile handset manufacturers, we went to all of them, Palm, Nokia, Apple, and tell them the story, hey, you have data locally available. You can work with that data as if it were a real database because it is a real database. You don't have to go over the wire and over the radio for every and each, each and every request. That translates into a lot more battery life for the user and not a like iPhone running out in a half day when you heavily use it. Using, not using, or not relying on the radio is a big thing in power consumption considerations in mobile devices. And everybody who works, by the low Nokia people here, you should be the not do the nodding thing. Thanks. <laughs> um, so this is a very big deal for the mobile, um, mobile web, or the, yeah, the mobile web here. Um, so summing up, simple app deployment, decentralized operation, being able to combine the cloud the, s the cloud thing, which is still necessary and a good thing, but also having decentralized things uh, when you choose to not use the cloud or when it's just not available. It's just a thumbs up thing. On top of that, CouchDB is all open source. Apache 2 is not owned, owned by a single uh, vendor. It's all standards based. We baked in all the web standards you can think of. Um, I wrote a book. I mentioned it. Uh, it looks like this. It's the O'Reilly Definitive Guide to CouchDB. And O'Reilly was so nice to allow us to put it under the Creative Commons license. Um, if you go to books.couchdb.org, you will find a free copy of the book you can just read. If you think that is nice that O'Reilly does that, please buy the book to show them if you like it. If you don't, please read the book, give comments. There's a commenting system so we can improve the book. So I'm very happy with you just reading the book. That'll be nice. Um, that's my talk. I have like 30 seconds left for questions. The question is if I'm beside Mozilla messaging, uh, Mozilla Raindrop, if I know any other mail systems that store stuff in Couch. We worked on a client project that is spam filtering where Couch to be the, the core storage. That's not an open source project or what? Um, so far, not. There is an open source Twitter client for Linux called Gwibber. It has a, the CouchDB backend, and they have some trouble using CouchDB correctly, which why they don't like it, but we're going to help them to make it good so that there'll be another messaging uh, service on top of that. Question in the back. How do you do a conflict resolution? Excellent question. Um, there is no way to do conflict resolution in a distributed system in a way that a computer could always predict. It's just impossible. There's logical proofs to prove that, so we don't even try. What CouchDB does, if it encounters, say you have two database A and B, you make a write here and a different write here, and then you replicate from A to B. What CouchDB does, it will accept that there is a conflict and will keep both versions of the conflict and also mark the document in uh, as to be in conflict. And you can get a real-time notification about a new document that is now in conflict to resolve the conflict. But it's left, as from, from the CouchDB perspective, to the client application to solve that conflict. Most of the time, 80%, I say, out of practice, the application can automatically resolve the, uh, the, the, the conflict because it knows, okay, but there might be timestamps that you trust that you can do the re resolution or you can, you see that it's, um, you can merge the document, it's two different fields that change, CouchDB doesn't do any fancy um, auto-merging. Uh, in some cases, you just don't know. If you change a, a phone number record here and do the same thing here because you forgot to do it here, but you did a typo here, how would any software system know which one's the right phone number? In that case, the user must decide, and your application needs to ask the user or say, uh, like needs to propagate the conflict status to the user. So we don't try to solve it, but we keep all the data. How does, how does the, uh, the notification system work? Uh, it is over HTTP. There's three modes. One is you just ask it, you get a reply, and that's done. You can get all the, it's called changes, and you can get all the changes since the beginning of the database's time. 
but you can also ask the changes since some sort of, like since the last time you asked, for example. You can also say, uh, put in a long polling option. That is, you just open the socket and wait until something changes and then get a reply the sockets get closed and you can reopen it. IE6, I think, needs that. There's also a continuous option where you can just open the socket and then whatever change comes over that socket, um, it gets used over there and just stays open forever. Uh, do we use Adam for that? No, it just uses line, well you get a line of JSON. We don't do any XML. Don't get me started on XML. Okay, um, what, sorry. Yeah, it's a, it's a line per change. It's a small JSON object. Is it what? Paged. Uh, you can ask for it, give me everything since and a number. So you can page from the client. Well, it's not that catchy, well, he gives me the cutoff sign. So, uh, you guys, thanks again. If you have any more questions, I'm around. And I hope you'll enjoy lunch upstairs. <laughs> <laughs>